MCC TV is largely about what happens in the classrooms of Metropolitan Community College. And we also present interviews with speakers, authors, and performers who visit our campuses. And once a quarter, we sit down with the president and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce to talk about the economic health and development of our viewing area. The conversation just ahead is about the second quarter of 2021, how we've navigated so far through the COVID pandemic and how we're doing overall so far this year. I'm your host, Kent Pavelka, and David Brown joins me next on MCC TV. Well, David, welcome back. Always good to see you. And uh, let's begin as we always do with uh, an overview, if you would, as you uh, maybe take a step back and look at things here in the middle of 2021 and how we're doing. Ken, good to see you again. Thanks for having me back here again. Um, you know, it, it's been a, a, a strange 2021, just like it's been, it was a strange 2020. Um, and we, we all were uh, very optimistic about the getting business back to business, getting people back to their offices, getting kind of back to our way of life. And uh, that all assumed that uh, we would continue to see shrinkage in the number of COVID cases out there, which would give everybody confidence we can go back and do our thing. Um, and I think in the second quarter of this year, that was pretty well accomplished. We were starting to hear uh, some indications that there was this thing called the Delta variant out there, but we weren't seeing a lot of indications of that here until we got towards the real end of the second quarter. Um, and and as, as a result, as we went through July and then into August, I'm sure we'll see some other things happening there too that um, probably aren't the kinds of things that we all want to see. But the good news is I think the first six months of this year, uh, we saw what a robust economy can look like in this market. We saw a lot of people come back to work. And we we ended up, uh, it, it, in December of last year, there was as many as uh, 30,000 people that dropped out of the labor force. And, um, you know, we, we were, we had at one point last year, 44,000 people unemployed in this region. Um, as of, I think, the end of July, we're probably looking at something like um, 16,000 people unemployed and probably only about 10,000 fewer people in the labor force now than there were back again in the beginning of the, the pandemic in 2020. So I think from a job perspective, we, we've made huge strides and um, it's been a really productive year so far. Well, you allude to the fact that we don't know, you know, what things might look like here in the next months ahead. Yep. Um, I, I mean, we don't know at all, really. I mean, do you, do you, do you have a feeling for that? Well, you know, I think the challenge is that we always knew that the vaccine was going to be the, you know, the big change maker. And I think uh, early indications that we were getting really good vaccination rates and uh, seeing really significant reductions in the uh, number of COVID cases led a lot of us to think about, okay, we can start planning for the fall as though we we're really a lot closer to um, this pre-COVID normal than we'd ever dreamed it would be. Um, but I think this variant has gotten to a point where it clearly um, is more contagious. It clearly is um, uh, something that's impacting young people, although not with necessarily a real aggressive cases, but uh, the folks who have always been uh, more susceptible to COVID are susceptible to the Delta variant too. And we've seen a very significant slowdown of people getting vaccinations. So with school coming on here pretty quickly, you know, there, there's gonna be a lot of kids in school that aren't vaccinated. And uh, as it turns out, some of their, a lot of their parents haven't been vaccinated. So um, I don't think there's any way we can decide what's going to happen next. Hospitals are starting to get filled up again. Um, I don't see any um, indication that the public sector is interested in going back to mandates or shutdowns. So I think it's going to be about all of us kind of minding our P's and Q's, being safe for ourselves and for others, and um, continuing to encourage those who are willing to, to get that, to get vaccinated, uh, because it just protects us all when they do. Sure. Well, having said all that, how tenuous is the is the uh, environment, the, the business environment? Do you, get, do you have a feel for that? Well, what's interesting is last year when we talked about this, we were all kind of new at this game of either operating remotely like we are today 
or having our offices have primarily remote um, ways of doing business. But after almost a year and a half of that, I mean, it, it's, it's so commonplace to kind of fit between one to the other. So I don't believe that there will be as much of an economic impact this time as there was last. Uh, I think productivity has been high for this past um, year and a half or so using this kind of a remote environment. Um, but I think everybody was looking back to getting together again because of the impact being elbow to elbow makes in the workplace, in social, social systems and families, et cetera. So um, I don't think the economy will be impacted as dramatically. I think maybe inflation will have more of an impact on it maybe than us going back to remote. Um, and I think world events have more to do maybe with confidence levels than, than whether or not we're remote for six more months or whether we're, we're not. Uh, we all want to not be remote if we can help it. Um, but in the end, we, we've proven we can do this. Yeah, it makes you, it makes you kind of salivate to, to, at the prospects of where the book, kind of boom we might have once things do get back to quote unquote normal, right? Absolutely. I mean, we're already seeing a labor shortage that we saw long before COVID hit um, really kick into gear when you've got 10,000 fewer people in the labor force and you've still got 16,000 people that are unemployed and your unemployment rate for Omaha MSA is around 3%, something like that. Um, there's not a lot of people out there uh, to be getting back to work. And the number one complaint that we're hearing is that there just aren't enough people. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, I think we just got to get to a point where, um, we, we can figure this out. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure what the long-term answer is, what the short-term answer is, but it is going to come down to keeping more of our people engaged, keeping more of them here, um, attracting people because of our quality of life and the kinds of things they can get here in this market. So we're, we're going to be fighting tooth and nail, just like we do for investment from all over. We're going to be fighting for every single person we can to come here and work. Um, are, in terms of labor shortages, are, is our area, our, our, our uh, economic area, uh, usually uh, has, have we been hit harder by that or are we in better shape than other areas of the country? Well, you know, it, it's a really good question. I think everywhere across the country is facing a labor shortage, everywhere, uh, even places where historically they have had a significant amount of in-migration of people, that migration has continued but there's still a huge shortage of, of folks. We've, our, if you look at the 2015 to 2019 uh, migration data, we actually saw a move in a very positive way uh, because of the number of folks who were foreign nationals that were coming to work in this region uh, on the one on the H-1B visa program. Um, I, mean, I would, would never have guessed that, that was going to be uh, the rationale for us to actually go from kind of negative net migration to positive net migration was going to be five years of significant growth in the amount of foreign nationals that come here to work. And to be in the H-1B visa program, these have got to be folks with skill sets that aren't available in this marketplace already. So if we just take a look at that group, it's somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 people a year from 2015 to 2019, 7,500 to 10,000 people that have come into this market in the last five years or so that are helping us meet our employee demand. So that's good news. We've got to keep bringing them in. It's not easy to do, but our, our, our companies have figured that out. Um, but we're not the only ones that are going out after foreign nationals and trying to get them here. There's a limit by how many the federal government will allow to come into each market. And I think we're pushing up against that every year. So um, there are some good signs, but I think we clearly have a job to do in uh, keeping our say 22 to 32 year olds here after they graduate from college, bringing some of our Nebraska kids back after they've gone away to college, bring them back here for their careers. Um, if we can be more aggressive there, be more successful there, I think we'll be able to win this, this talent battle um, that's waging across the whole country. There are uh, themes that we've been hearing relative to how the pandemic has affected this country, the world, and, and specifically regarding this conversation, the economy. And a couple of those things we keep hearing about, and you mentioned one of them, inflation, uh, and then the supply chain. Talk about that a little bit. How big, how big a problem is inflation? And, I, and what, what, are there economists that you look to for insight on these things? Well, I'm probably like a lot of people. I kind of find as much information as I can from everybody I can find it from. And um, 
on different topics, you know, you, some, some seem to be more informed than others, but, you know, I, th I think inflation is an easy one. You know, we've been seeing wage increases over the past decade or two, typically in the two to two and a half, maybe 3% weight range, ranges that were happening pretty regularly. Um, but when inflation was only one and a half or 2%, uh, your quality of life and your spending uh, power uh, was growing because your increase was higher than inflation. Now we're in a situation we haven't seen in a long time where inflation is, is increasing and it's greater than the kind of pay increases that people are getting. So that means that their, their buying power is less rather than more. Uh, we saw some of this um, early on when, um, in, when health insurance was seeing these huge spikes and so your, if your employer was providing you with health insurance, it was taking a bigger portion of your check than you were getting in an increase in pay that you might get at the end of the year. Um, you know, we really can't afford to have that happen. I mean, people, the confidence that people have in the economy is what drives consumer spending. If they don't believe that they can actually make money, get better at the end of each year after a, a year's worth of work, their confidence goes down and their spending drops. And our economy is based on about 70% consumer spending. So there's this direct correlation between how much you make, how much you can afford to spend, what your confidence level looks like, and what does that do for the overall economy now that we all depend upon. Um, so I think inflation is a challenge. Part of that inflation challenge is as a result of supply chain problems. Um, so we've all heard about the, the microchip problem that the auto industry is having can't build as many cars if you don't have enough chips. Supply and demand means that the supply is, is not meeting the demand, then prices go up. And you know, we're not selling as many vehicles. And so that impacts the auto industry and the people that are working in the industry. And lumber has gone up because you can't get lumber from other countries where we typically would be shipping it in from overseas. Uh, there's, we saw this early in the pandemic that a lot of our medical supplies and equipment was actually produced overseas. Yes. And so we couldn't just ramp it up and bring it in and use what we needed to. Um, shipping de de delays after the canal was blocked and shipping delays on the West Coast due to the Teamster strikes and slowing the unloading of ships has all paid, to, paid into this, this challenge of, uh, of a shrinking supply of some commodities, which causes those prices to go up. Um, so I, I think it, it's normal economics that that's what happens. Um, but I think if, if we can, if this is transitory, as some would like us to think, that'll be a good thing. It'll kind of it'll blip, it'll shrink, things will go away once the supply chain kind of gets back in gear again. Um, is, is that whistling past the graveyard a little bit, that idea? Well, I don't know. I mean, inflation's <laughs> only been high for a few months. True. And think about it. And so in a few months in the scheme of things is, is nothing. Uh, one would hope that when we, if we talk about this next spring, that inflation would have gotten under control. By the time we talk next spring, we'll know really well whether or not this inflation is transitory or not. But um, my crystal ball isn't any clearer than yours on this one, Kent. Let's talk uh, about economic development so far in 2021 here in our area. I'll go through some numbers real quickly, if you don't mind, the capital yeah. investment kinds of things, uh, projects landed, et cetera. Sure. So we've had a, a good first half of the year, um, almost a billion dollars in projects landed already through the second quarter, um, $967 million worth. We had a goal for the year of about $400 million in capital investment. So we've we're, we've blown past that because of a couple of good size uh, data projects, the data center projects that we're working on and some warehousing projects. Um, you know, those, the, the reasons these projects are good, whether they're the Amazon um, announced project, you know, where they're both doing the sortation center in, in Council Bluffs, as well as the, the, the large project that we announced uh, later in the year last year. I mean, that's, that's 2000 jobs that are gonna be in this marketplace um, and, and that's a really good thing. It's also, they're also a very large capital investment. So um, good news about Council Bluffs getting the, the sort of sortation center, which I sort of look at it as the, the great big data or the great big warehouse we're getting is sort of the, uh, everything comes into there and then it goes into these smaller sortation centers for delivery. So, so think of the sortation center as the way you actually get that thing you buy on Amazon Prime. Um, so the, the, those are two very good things. Um, 
we've got a, a good sized um, investment in a uh, local local tech startup called Veracred. Mm -hmm. um, they got about twenty three million dollars in a new round of Series B funding, and it, it's an insurance tech platform of some sort. And they're going to double its employee base in this market, so they'll get up to a couple hundred people here. Um, you know, and if you think about all these things, payroll is important. These would generate about $19 million um, a year in uh, new payroll that'll come into this marketplace for our workers here. So uh, those are just two examples of, of some, some pretty good economic development projects that have been announced in the second quarter. You bet. And I, what are we talking about? $20 million in terms of uh, payroll associated with... Uh... Yeah, that's at 19.3 million of, of yeah. this for the landed projects for the first half of 21. Yep. Yeah. A lot of uh, what can happen and can't happen uh, depends on what happens in the unicameral every year. I don't know yeah. that we've, we've talked in much detail about uh, what happened in the 2021 uh, unicameral in terms of uh, let's start with successes. Um, yeah. So you know, 2020 was all about getting the incentives passed. I and mean, we've been working on that for years and we had to get it done in 2020. 2021 was sort of one of those strange years where we didn't have a singular bill that we were trying to get passed. We were trying to do as much positive things as we could for the business community and to avoid as much negative stuff as we did. So we had several things that were important. The first was um, to figure out a way to limit civil liability for um, employers and facilities um, uh, from people who are working for them uh, who contract COVID uh, while they're either in the workplace or uh, would make that claim at least. And so we wanted to try and protect businesses who could safely reopen um, from uh, who knows how many frivolous lawsuits that might come down the pike. So we had to have some guidelines. And so the law basically says if companies follow CDC guidelines for their customers, and their employees, that their liability against lawsuits is, is limited. We were supportive of that bill when it passed. Um, we've been working on a bill for a few years on uh, establishing an inland port authority. Um, that's what basically that enables us to do is to, to work on some very large projects. Um, inland port is an in interesting sort of term that says railroads and trucks that at some point or another can get you down to a water port. Um, and so we can do that. And it allows us to, to set up five different mega sites across the state um, to enable to, uh, us to attract the larger projects that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, we had some pretty significant tax stuff this past year. I mean, we ended up reducing the, the corporate tax rate maximum from 7.8 to, to 7.5 in the first year and a 7 a quarter percent in the second year. That's the first time in 30 years that that rate has been lowered. So it, it's a pretty significant move. And actually, it says eventually we'll end up with a parity between the maximum corporate rate and the maximum individual income tax rate. Let me ask you why that's important. Well, you know, about most of our companies in this state pay their income taxes as part of their personal income tax. Um, and so what we've created here is this um, ability for um, companies other than C-Corps, as they're called, um, to pay at a lower rate, which right now is 6.89% compared to uh, as it was 7.8%. Like um, S -corp, you're talking about S-Corps. Yeah, S corps, LLCs, anybody, any of those corps that's basically set up to use your individual income tax as a way to, to pay it. Um, large corporations, the biggest of our corporations in large measure are C corps, which means they pay at the higher rate. You know, and we're trying to keep these companies here. It's a relatively small part of our overall billions of dollars of budgets. It's about two hundred and thirty million dollars annually. Uh, but we think we ought to be able to be able to tell the largest companies in the world, you're welcome here, too. And so we're going to treat you from a tax perspective the same way we do our smaller businesses. Gotcha. Um, we had a couple of, couple of other bills that passed. One called the, we call it the hairstyle bill, which basically um, eliminates the ability for companies to uh, discriminate in, in employment practices uh, because somebody has an elaborate hairstyle that is different maybe than they might want to expect. Um, depending upon the diversity, uh, the ethnicity of, of an individual, um, they have different challenges when it comes to hairstyles in the workplace, particularly manufacturing. And we were finding some companies were um, challenged by that. So we wanted to put a bill in place that would protect those individuals uh, in the workplace. Um, and we got a, a couple of things out of the budget that are really pretty interesting too. We got some money for a revolving loan fund. 
um, that was in the Imagine Nebraska Act last year, but wasn't funded. So we're able to get that funded. Uh, we got some more dollars in the customized job training fund, which will help us with that talent piece that you talked about. And we got some money back in the Business Innovation Act, which is the way the state is able to help invest in startups in, in, this, in the state. And neither the customized job training or the Business Innovation Act have been funded in a while. So those are good, both really good moves for us. There is always the uh, discussion going on about the future of transportation in Omaha, yeah. um, the Connect Go uh, program. Explain what that is, and then we'll talk a little bit about the strategy that was, that was outlined for that in, in July. Sure. So the, the, when the mayor started the Smart Cities Committee a few years ago, um, the group did some strategic planning, and one of its primary goals was to establish a regional transportation strategy. Um, the chamber was already working on a process, and so we agreed to take on that work for the Smart Cities Group. And so we created a program called Connect Go, uh, which was a development of a, a strategy for regional transportation. Um, and we released the 11-part strategy uh, in the month of July and uh, presented that not only to the board, but to the public at large, they could see what we thought were, were some key components that were necessary for us to have a, an effective, an effective uh, transportation strategy for the next 20 years or so. Yeah, it would include uh, everything, but the kitchen sink, buses, streetcars. Uh, yeah, so you think bike, about bike lanes, et cetera. Yeah. And all the things that you really want to think, see about a multimodal transportation piece, but, but it has to connect both east and west as well as north and south. So it had a couple of extra uh, additional orbit lines running north and south in addition to what's already running east and west, uh, bus service improvements in SARP and, Count and Council Bluffs, uh, moving people around the urban core more effectively, including an urban connector, um, which is kind of what we, we, we've been calling a streetcar for the longest time, um, streetscapes in historic business districts, sidewalk improvements near schools and transit routes, um, bike lanes on streets as well as trails, uh, multimodal Missouri River Bridge, smart traffic signaling, uh, strategic widening and routing of trucks, employee transportation, on-demand management, and continuing the road maintenance that we have. Um, I mean, th th those were all important attributes that said over the next 20 or 30 years, we should do all of this stuff. Now we gotta figure out how to pay for it. And that's kind of the next step is what do we do next? Where's the money coming from? And Frankly, with all the money coming out of Washington, a good number of these things could probably get funded sooner rather than later. Yeah, there you go. Uh, just raise your hand if you want some of that money and have an idea where you can spend it, right? I tried, but it hasn't worked. None have come my way yet, but I know <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're, all, we're working awful hard to see where, I mean, we know the state's got a good chunk of it. They're gonna be distributing starting in, October, in uh, January. So is the city, so is the county, so do most units of government. Schools have all gotten their own chunk of change. So there's a bunch of money that's floating around out there. And we think a good bit of it, as just like the infrastructure bill that um, just passed um, the Senate, um, a good bit of it should come to the state. Even that federal infrastructure bill, if it gets through the House, I mean, that's about two and a half billion dollars coming to the state of Nebraska for infrastructure. And that was important. And you know, we had um, some important votes in the Senate on that one. Senator Fisher was really helpful in moving that forward. And she did a good job of explaining it in our legislative um, event we had last week, uh, what was going to be in there and why it was beneficial to uh, her constituents. Not sure if you do this every year, but every so often a new class of the Omaha Business Hall of Fame. And sometimes we don't have any time to mention these folks. So I think there are half a dozen of them. You want to have a word or, word or two about each sure. honoree? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think what's, what's a shame is last year we, we, had, we got cut off due to COVID and we, you know, we really couldn't talk much about uh, the Hall of Fame because we postponed the event for a year. Um, so we're doing the event here at the end of August and uh, we're really proud to uh, bring into the Hall of Fame, Ron Gartland, who's the owner, president and CEO of Godfather's Pizza, uh, James and Karen Lindner from the, James is the chief executive of Nebraska Medicine. Uh, he's been around for a long time. He's a professor of pathology and microbiology at uh, UNMC. And his wife, Karen, uh, is the CEO of Linseed Capital, which is a venture capital firm. Um, and she's also the executive chair, chairwoman of one of the companies that they incubated, uh, Tethon uh, 3D. Uh, Rodrigo Lopez, who's the chairman of Amerispheres Company, he's a, a developer now, but he is also 
uh, when he owned Amerisphere, was the largest uh, residential uh, multifamily mortgage company in the country. Um, Bob Leader, who's the past president of Leader Construction Company, uh, and Paul Smith, who's the board of state, he was on the board of stakeholders at Tenasca, and he's the president of Black Dog Management, which is the developer that is currently doing the uh, mill district in uh, near North Omaha. So a really great crop of, of people, uh, well-deserved, and so we're going to be celebrating them uh, here at the end of August. Well-deserved honors for each, each of those individuals. Um, maybe finally, something you alluded to briefly, but just, just your thoughts, maybe some things that are in your craw about the, those national and world issues that uh, either have affected or will affect us here in our area. Well, there's no doubt that uh, how COVID is impacting the whole world, and it's different everywhere you go, but there seems to be a big spike happening in a lot of different countries right now, um, and even in parts of our country. So we're going to see that impact us. It, it's, it's going to happen here, too. we got to be prepared for that. I think the challenge in Afghanistan is, is, a, is a big one. I mean, what we've seen in the last uh, several weeks has been challenging, and um, you know, we need to realize that foreign policy has changed and our position in the world may have changed as a result of it. And so we've got to continue to be careful, uh, but continue to think about the role that we play in the world. I and mean, as things get more complex, things get more cautious. And as things get more cautious, investments slow down, things slow down, people slow down. So um, you're always looking for a consumer confidence to be up here. And uh, to the extent that it might, might be dropping some, uh, just means it slows things down a bit. And then finally, we talked about 2021 and the unicameral, but as you look at uh, local and, and regional issues, uh, what pops at you here in the next next months? Well, we are just coming out with um, the plan for comprehensive tax reform that will we'll spend a lot of time in the legislature next year. Um, we've been working on this for a few years through Blueprint Nebraska. Uh, it, it's a, a great plan. It's very aggressive. Um, it would bring our our top rate down to below 5% for our in, for income tax payments, which it's 6.89 now, so we'll drop it down below five. Um, it, it means that we'll be getting rid of some of our sales tax exemptions out there. And so while we'll save money on income tax, we'll be spending more on sales tax. The more money you make, the more money you're spending on sales tax. Um, the big change here is anybody that makes $50,000 or less won't pay any income tax in the state. Mm. Right now it's a 29,000. So it's, it's a lot of big changes that we've got to talk to our business people about and get the legislators on board for us. So we can kind of move it forward. But that, that's a big one um, that we've been talking about for a long time. Um, you know, the, the elections in 22 are coming up and so campaign season will begin here, here pretty soon, I think, if they haven't already. Um, so there'll be a lot of debate about what's gonna be happening in, um, in Congress and with the Senate. Um, and that'll make a big impact on how people feel about this country too. So elections matter and the outcomes of elections make a difference. David, thanks again. Appreciate you being with us and we'll look forward to next time. Thanks, Kent. Take care of yourself. And thank you for being with us on MCC TV. Our goal to better acquaint you with the mission leadership and the reach of the college. I'm Kent Pavelka along with David Brown for Metropolitan Community College.